Live from Cincinnati's School for the Creative and Performing Arts in the Eric Kunzel Center for Arts and Education in Over the Rhine, this is the Ohio First District Congressional Debate. Good evening, everyone. I'm Clyde Gray. For the next hour, I'll be moderating tonight's debate between Republican Steve Shabbat and Democrat Steve Driehaus. We are privileged tonight to be in the brand new Corbett Theater at the School for the Creative and Performing Arts. And we want to thank the Cincinnati Public Schools for welcoming us into this beautiful new facility. The candidates will be joining us on stage in just a moment, but first, a little bit about them. Steve Shabbat is a Republican. He's 57 years old. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in History from the College of William and Mary and a law degree from the Salmon P. Chase College of Law. He has worked as a teacher and an attorney in private practice. He has served as a Cincinnati City Council member and Hamilton County Commissioner and represented the 1st District in Congress for seven terms. He has been retired since leaving office last year. He and his wife Donna have two children. They live in Westwood. Democrat Steve Driehaus is 44 years old. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Miami University and a Master of Public Affairs in Public Finance from Indiana University. He has worked as Assistant Director of the Center for International Education and Development Assistance at Indiana University. He also worked as a legislative aide to Cincinnati City Council member Todd Portune and Congressman Charlie Lucan, and before that was a Peace Corps volunteer. Mr. Driehaus represented the 31st District in the Ohio House for four terms before being elected to the U.S. House in 2008, the office he holds today. He and his wife, Lucienne, have three children. They live in Price Hill. The audience here in the Corbett Theater has been instructed to remain silent, except for this very moment when they join me in welcoming Steve Shabbat and Steve Driehaus. The candidates will field questions tonight that have been submitted by the public as well as those posed by our panel of journalists. They are Inquirer Government and Politics Editor Carl Weiser, Lincoln Ware of AM 1230 The Buzz, and Tom McKee of Nine News. The debate will be conducted under rules agreed to by the campaigns. They are... Each candidate will have two minutes to deliver an opening statement. Then the questioning begins. For each question, each candidate will get a 90-second response, with the first candidate also receiving 30 seconds for rebuttal. The rules do allow for follow-up questions at the moderator's discretion. In the event of a follow-up, each candidate will receive 30 seconds for a response. Each candidate will then get two minutes apiece for a closing statement. Representatives of the League of Women Voters are keeping track of the time for us tonight, and it will be up to me to make sure the candidates stick to their times. As I've said before, that's a job I relish. A coin flip prior to tonight determined the order of candidates and the order in which they would speak. And the first opening statement tonight goes to Mr. Shabbat, who now has two minutes. Thank you, Clyde. Uh, I'd like to... First of all, I'll make a correction. I'm not retired. I've been practicing law since I've been out. I'm not sure where they messed up on that, but I wanted to make that clear. I wanted to thank uh, the panelists. I wanted to thank you, Clyde. Uh, thank the uh, sponsors of this debate. Thank the audience here and those that are watching this at home this evening. Um, and, you know, I think this election, when you boil it all down, it really is all about moving our country forward. And I think Mr. Driehaus and I would probably agree on that. Where we would disagree is the direction that we ought to move uh, the country. Now, Mr. Driehaus's vision of where we ought to move the country, you can kind of look at his voting record. Uh, it's, a, it's a direction of uh, health care takeovers, for example, which I think has been, uh, will be devastating if this thing stays in effect. Um, it's a stimulus package which stimulated more government, especially in Washington, but not jobs uh, in the private sector. Um, it was uh, new energy taxes that passed the House, fortunately not the Senate yet, but that would really, I think, harm many, many workers. Um, and 
deficits as far as the eye can see. Um, I think there's a better way. I think what we need to do is to pursue policies where we can turn this economy around, get America back to work again. Uh, we need to get the spending in Washington under control. It's absolutely un out of control. It wasn't as fiscally disciplined as it should have been under Republican control. It's completely out of control since the Democrats took over completely two years ago. And we also need to repeal the health care debacle, is what I call it. It's, it's, there are a lot of things we needed to do to reform it. I'm sure we'll talk about some of those things tonight. But this wasn't it. We need to take some common sense steps, get the economy moving, get America back to work. That's what I'll do if I have the opportunity to represent uh, this district once again. Thank, thank you thank very you. much, Mr. Shabbat. Mr. Driehaus, you now have two minutes for your opening statement. Well, Clyde, thank you very much, and thank you to WCPO and our, our sponsors and our panelists here this evening. Uh, thank you to my wife, Lucienne, and my mom, Claire, and my daughter, Alex, who are joining us this evening as well. Um, it seems like we were just here, uh, but that was two years ago. And, you know, you don't always get to choose the time in which you serve. And I happen to be elected in a time uh, during the worst economic conditions in most of our lifetimes, certainly the worst since the 1930s. When we walked in the door, the month I took the oath of office, the economy lost 750,000 jobs. Because of the policies of the previous administration, in the last six months of 2008, the economy lost three million jobs. This is about the future, and it's about who was acting. The president challenged us in Congress to do something about the economy, to do something about the hemorrhaging, and we acted. The stimulus that Mr. Shabbat calls a failure, over $300 billion in tax cuts for small businesses and families across greater Cincinnati and Ohio. This was about growing jobs. If you go down to the banks today, people are working, hundreds of workers are there because of the stimulus. There was an article this morning in the Enquirer about research being done at UC because of the stimulus. Teachers, firefighters, police officers now have jobs today because of that Recovery Act. It was the right thing to do for America. We stopped the hemorrhaging. But there are a lot of people that want to take us back. And just this week, we filed our finance reports. And folks, they've weighed in. Exxon, Marathon, Occidental Petroleum, the big health insurance companies, the Wall Street banks, and millionaires across America, they want their friend back. They want Steve Shabbat back because they know that the policies he will pursue will benefit them. Mr. This has Greenhouse, never been thank you. I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut you off at this point. We go now to our questions, beginning with Carl Weiser of The Inquirer, who has the first question for Mr. Shabbat. Mr. Shabbat, uh, the top issue this year is jobs. Uh, you were in Congress for 14 years. What did you personally do to bring any jobs to the first congressional district, and what will you do? Uh, if you're returned to office. And Mr. Shabbat, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to answer that question, but before I do, I have to also recognize that my wife and my mother and my daughter are here this evening, too, and I want to welcome them as well. Now, relative to jobs, that has to be probably the most critical issue that we have facing our country right now, that along with the economy. Um, I happen to have been the last two years that ranking member of the Small Business Committee. Um, that's the committee in Congress where uh, the action is when it comes to trying to move jobs forward at the small business level. Seventy percent of the jobs that are now created uh, in this economy over the last three or four decades, it's not the big guys, not the big corporations, it's small business owners, it's small mom and pop startups. Um, and unfortunately, the policies that this administration uh, have carried out have been counterproductive. What I did was to consistently vote to lower taxes, for example. Um, that did spur economic growth uh, for a period of time. Unfortunately, obviously, uh, we had an economic downturn. Um, but that, for quite a while, did have a very positive effect. We need to go much farther in reducing the taxes on small business owners, for example. Um, also, balanced budgets 
are good for the economy and good for job creation. Now, the Democrats hadn't had a balanced budget in 30 years before Republicans took over back in 94. One of the key things that we wanted to do was to balance the budget. And we got the budget balanced for four years, and that's the type of thing that we knew we needed to do to once again get this economy moving and get jobs created. And, and certainly, we Mr. Chabot, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. And Mr. Driehaus, you now have 90 seconds for your response to that question. Carl, I think the, the question was specifically, what did you do to create jobs, not what committees did you serve on? And uh, Mr. Chabot runs away from his record of 14 years. Your paper, just about a month ago, uh, on the opinion page talked about the manufacturing jobs in the state of Ohio. 38,000 manufacturing jobs lost in greater Cincinnati in the last 10 years Mr. Shabbat was in office. That's what he failed to do. What have I done? I took on my own leadership when they wanted to strip funding for the competitive engine for the joint strike fighter at GE. Not only is it the wrong thing to do for the country to have only one engine on the joint strike fighter, but it's the wrong thing to do for Cincinnati. I took on my own leadership as a freshman member. I was able to swing about 149, 150 votes, Democratic votes. And we saved the funding for the Joint Strike Fighter. That is 1,000 jobs at the GE plant. And while Mr. Shabbat shares my opinion with that, the fact is, had he been there, those jobs would have been lost because he couldn't swing those Democratic members. So it was me partnering with Gene Schmidt and John Boehner to get the job done. We passed a small business bill. Taxes are lower on small businesses because of the bill we just passed. And we've created access to capital to help small businesses grow into the future. So we are moving in the right direction. We are creating jobs. All right, Mr. Driehaus, thank you. Uh, Mr. Shabbat, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. Yeah, Mr. Driehaus mentions the Joint Strike Force engine, the second engine. The Republican administration was trying to cut out that same program, those same jobs, and I fought to keep them. And they were kept at that point. The Democratic administration is trying to cut them out. He's essentially doing the same thing. He talks about jobs lost when I was there. When, they pay, when he was sworn in, the unemployment in this country was 7.6 percent. It's now 9.6 percent. 2% higher than it was, that's an awful lot of jobs in this community and all across the country. Thank you, sir. WDBZ's Lincoln Ware has the next question, and that is for Mr. Driehaus. Uh, yes, Mr. Driehaus, I want to give you a chance tonight to set the record straight. There's been a lot of talk on, uh, in your district, uh, around the, the city, about whether you voted for taxpayer-funded abortions. Now, if you did we want to know why. If you didn't, we want to know why are they lying on you. Mr. Driehaus, you have 90 seconds. Thanks, Lincoln. I absolutely did not vote for taxpayer-funded abortions. As a matter of fact, I was one of the pro-life Democrats that stood up to my own party and said we will not vote for a health care bill if there's a single dollar going to taxpayer-funded abortions. So we got the president to pass an executive order, to sign an executive order, an executive order that has the power of law, like the Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order. It's been tested three times, first on the high-risk pools in both New Mexico and Pennsylvania and across the country, and it's proven through HHS that no federal funds can be used for abortion in the high-risk pools. Secondly, federally qualified health centers. The HHS came out with a statement under the power of the executive order prohibiting any funding for abortion coverage in the health care bill to those medical centers. And then finally, just a few weeks ago, HHS came out with rules with regard to the funds that are going to be used once the exchange is up and running and the segregation of the funds. Again, they determined not a single dollar can be used for taxpayer-funded abortions. The problem? is that folks like Right to Life and others are far more concerned about the politics than they are the practicality of whether or not there are taxpayer funds being used for abortion. The Catholic hospitals are with us. The nuns are with us. And the bishops are coming around. But there is not a single dollar that's being used for taxpayer-funded abortion. And I would challenge Mr. Shabbat to show us a single check a single provider. All right, uh, Mr. Driehaus, we're going to turn it over now to Mr. Shabrit for his 90-second response. Thank you. Well, Mr. Driehaus says he challenged me to find a single dollar. The bill was just enacted a number of months ago. Much of the stuff doesn't even happen till next year, the year out, the year out, and the year out after that. Um, and Mr. Driehaus has said that he's pro-life. Uh, and it's interesting 
Uh, National Right to Life keeps track of all our voting records. I had 100 uh, percent lifetime score with National Right to Life. Uh, Mr. Driehaus's score at this point with them is a whopping 33 percent. And it wasn't just the health care bill. The health care bill clearly to many people uh, was a vote to allow funding uh, for abortion. Um, the courts may ultimately determine that and other things and other money down the road. But the, but the fact is that he had originally said he would not support that bill unless they changed the language in the bill. And then at the 11th hour, they went down the White House, they got something, an executive order from President Obama. The first thing, and do you trust President Obama to protect innocent unborn life on the abortion issue? One of his very first actions when he became president was to reverse the Mexico City language. Now, what is that? Well, it's language that says none of our tax dollars can go to pay for or provide abortions overseas. That had been stopped under President Bush. He reversed that and said, yes, our tax dollars can go. And Mr. Driehaus also voted an appropriations bill to allow tax dollars to go overseas. And he also voted for the Pence Amendment. Now, against the Pence Amendment, the Pence Amendment was to prevent tax dollars from going to Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion provider in the country. He voted for that as well. I have a stellar, I think, pro-life record, and I think everybody knows that. All right, Mr. Shabbat. Uh, Mr. Driehaus, you now have 30 seconds to rebut. So your answer is you can't find a dollar of funding going to abortions in the health care bill. And that's the reality. In terms of Title 10, which you're referring to, uh, low-income health care for women, yeah, you better believe it. I'm going to support low-income health care for women. It's unfortunate that Planned Parenthood is often one of the only providers. Just this week, the Ohio Elections Commission sided with us, saying there's probable cause to stop billboards going up from your allies, suggesting that I did vote for taxpayer-funded abortion. So I think the evidence is clear. There's not a dollar going to taxpayer-funded abortion. All right, Mr. Driehaus, thank you. Tom McKee of Nine News has the next question. That will be for Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Clyde. In talking to people who live in places like Coleraine Township and Mount Airy and North College Hill and Westwood and Price Hill, one of the concerns they have on their minds is the proliferation of Section 8 vouchers uh, for people living in their neighborhoods. And it really relates to quality of life issues. What changes or what new regulations need to be done to reverse this trend, to change this situation for the people who live in the first district? 90 seconds. Yeah. Section 8 housing uh, needs to be controlled. I think it needs to be reduced. I think it's uh, been uh, an, it's affected a number of neighborhoods, including the neighborhood I live in, Westwood, and one I lived in before that price sale very adversely. Um, oftentimes because you have absentee landlords, you have people that ultimately get vouchers uh, who oftentimes aren't taking care of, of the property. So federal legislation can have effect. Now, you also have a local board uh, that handles it, but there is federal dollars going into this as well. Um, when I was there, I offered a number of amendments to the bills to try to improve Section 8 reform the program. <clears throat> Number one, to reduce the funding, to eliminate the funding, we were unsuccessful in doing that. Then I offered amendments to allow the landlords to eliminate people who were dealing drugs or had criminal behavior so it didn't affect the rest of the community, rest of the neighborhood. Um, I also offered an amendment uh, that would make it a five-year limit so you couldn't get these vouchers forever. Um, right now, there's no limit at all. And, and finally, to require people who are getting the vouchers to actually work uh, if they're if they're receiving a voucher. Now, Mr. Driehaus voted to increase the funding. This was in the stimulus bill, $2.5 billion. Uh, and, and that's about the last thing we need is not only to allow existing dollars that are already in the program to go, but to allow that much more money to go into a program, which I think is, is harming this community in many ways. Mr. Driehaus, you have 90 seconds. Well, I just heard Mr. Shabbat say that in the 14 years he was there, he offered a bunch of failed amendments, but didn't make any change when it came to the neighborhoods that we represent. Section 8 grew, and he didn't do anything about it. We actually worked on replacing the members of the Metropolitan Housing Authority Board. My brother was appointed to the board, as, several, as well as several others, in order to address some of the challenges faced by Section 8. I created a housing task force, which got together and looked at all of the housing challenges in our neighborhoods, one of those being the reimbursement policies for Section 8 vouchers, specifically in neighborhoods with affordable rental property and affordable purchasing uh, residential property. And what we found was that they were artificially inflated. We went after CMHA. We got them to reduce those voucher rates. Not only that, we got them to take away the 10 percent increase that they were giving for single-family homes versus rentals. As a member of Congress, I've done even more. I made changes to the moving to work requirements when we took up Section 8 in the Financial Services Committee. 
Mr. Shabbat talks about the stimulus bill, but I was the only Democrat on the Financial Services Committee to vote against that bill with Section 8 vouchers because it didn't go far enough with regard to moving to work. I continued to work with the Department of Housing and Human Development housing and urban development to make sure that Cincinnati is a moving to work program, which I think is critically important. And I will continue to fight for our neighborhoods just like I always have. Mr. Shabbat, 30 seconds to rebut. Well, I heard Mr. Driehaus say that his brother was on the board and he still essentially didn't do anything about it. We have as many or more Section 8 vouchers right now as we had prior to Mr. Driehaus going to Congress. And uh, it's got to change because Cincinnati is too important to let our neighborhoods continue to deteriorate. All right. Thank you, sir. Inquirer editor Carl Weiser is next with a question for Mr. Driehaus. Mr. Driehaus, uh, you say you're a fiscal conservative, uh, but in the last two years, uh, the federal deficit and the national debt have hit record levels. So when you say you're a fiscal conservative, why should voters believe you? 90 seconds. Well, it's the record. If you look at the 09 omnibus, the biggest budget uh, bill that came, the biggest appropriations budget that came forward, I voted no. The biggest appropriations bill in 2010, uh, I voted no. I continually voted no against appropriations bills that I thought were excessive. I voted against about $500 billion in spending. But I think the proof is in the pudding. Uh, you know, we all get our office budgets. And I return more money to the Treasury, $300,000, than any other member of Congress in the state of Ohio. Compare that to Mr. Shabbat. Mr. Shabbat, when he left office, gave $50,000 in bonuses to his staff. That's not being fiscally conservative. That's not being fiscally prudent. When you walk out and you figure you're not going to serve again, so you give $50,000 in bonuses to your staff. $5,000 to your campaign manager. Now that is not being responsible to taxpayers in the 1st Congressional District. I continue to put my money where my mouth is. I return money from my office budget to the Treasury, and I continue to vote against bills that I think are excessive with regard to spending. The deficit, the deficit was created under their watch. We inherited a nightmare and tried to put the genie back in the bottle. And he wants to continue the deficit spending by continuing the Bush tax credits, which would add $4 trillion more in the next 10 years. All right, sir, so Mr. Shabbat, you have 90 seconds. Yeah, Mr. Driehaus has twisted so many things around and got so many things wrong, it's really hard to know even where to begin. Let's start with this $300,000 that he gave back. Uh, during my time in Congress, we gave almost $3 million back, and far more per term than you ever did. Now, this $50,000, um, I think it's appropriate when you have people that have served our country and served uh, your constituents for a number of years um, when they're going to have to look for new jobs to give a one month uh, severance pay. I mean, I think that's appropriate. It's done in the private industry. It's done throughout the government. I think that's appropriate. You talk about treating workers fairly, and now you want to make a political issue about that. I think that's pretty low, Steve. Now, relative to being fiscally prudent, um, you know, he keeps saying he stood up to his party leadership. He's voted with Nancy Pelosi 94.8 percent, almost 95 percent, probably the most liberal speaker we've had in our nation's history. How can you vote for an $814 billion stimulus package and call yourself a fiscal conservative. I mean, it's just absurd. And then this health care bill that's going to put us into debt far into the future, uh, and just one thing after another. Um, so you're clearly not a fiscal conservative. Um, on the other hand, I actually had a record of being a fiscal conservative, and will if I get back. Citizens Against Government Waste gave me a 97% gave him an 11 percent for voting against wasteful spending. National Taxpayers Union gave me a lifetime A, gave him an F. Uh, rebuttal, Mr. Driehaus? Yes, yeah, Citizens Against Government Waste. The citizens, ExxonMobil, Philip Morris, Merrill Lynch. National Taxpayers Union, <laughs> Philip Morris, and the National Tobacco Institute. He gets their great grades because he votes in their favor. He voted against health care for low-income children, the expansion of SCHIP because it would have raised cigarette taxes. So of course you're their hero. That's why they want you back, Steve. All right, thank you. Lincoln Ware of The Buzz has the next question addressed to Mr. Shabbat. Yes, uh, Mr. Shabbat, uh, you and uh, your party talk about all the money that the Obama um, administration is wasting, all the spending, and you talk about you cut spending. Uh, I think on the 2000 census, Cincinnati had, was one of the third poorest cities in the country. 
uh, with all these spending cuts you plan to enact, how do you plan to represent all of the poor people in your district? You have 90 seconds. Yeah, I think that's an excellent uh, question, Lincoln. And when you are elected to Congress, you do represent all the people, every neighborhood, whether or not those people voted for you or not. That's your responsibility. That's what we did, whether it's constituent services uh, or, or any of the rest. And now, the original question you dealt with spending, you know, and my party, et cetera. Um, I don't trust the Democrats on spending. I don't trust the Republicans either. Uh, to be quite honest with you. I think it's good to have a healthy skepticism of both parties when it comes to spending. Now, the spending under the Democrats has been far worse. Republicans were pikers compared to the spending that's been going on since they took over. Um, we've had over $3 trillion of new deficit spending in less than two years. We've got a $13 trillion deficit now. And it ultimately means that every child that's born now in this country has something like $42,000 of debt piled on them just waiting for it. It means a lower standard of living. You know, we're probably the first generation where, you know, one of the good things about being an American was that we always thought our kids could do better, a little bit better than we did. A lot of people are starting to wonder if we really will be better to our kids. Uh, you know, our son is, a, is a, a student in college right now, and we were you know, we were talking, and maybe we're glad he's not graduating this year or next year. It's the following year. Hopefully the economy will be working out. But a lot of people's sons and daughters are graduating. We've got to get this economy moving. We've got to get jobs going again. Mr. Driehaus, your 90-second response. Well, again, I'll remind you of the greatest recession in our lifetimes caused by your policies. Uh, 38,000 manufacturing jobs right here in greater Cincinnati lost. And while you talk about the debt burden on our children, what's your solution? To give millionaires tax cuts. A $4 trillion addition to the deficit over the next 10 years. How is that fiscally responsible? That is not fiscal responsibility. The fact of the matter is, you voted for two wars that were unpaid for. The Republican Congress passed Medicare Part D, unpaid for. And then the largest tax cut for millionaires in our lifetimes, unpaid for, didn't bring back the revenue that it was anticipated, and then the deregulation of the financial services sector and the allowance of the Wall Street bankers to run away with this economy, causing the greatest recession in our li lifetimes, dramatically reducing the amount of revenue coming into the government and creating the worst deficits we've ever seen. It was a trajectory for disaster. We stopped the hemorrhaging. We had to spend money in the short term to stop the hemorrhaging. But we did it, and we're now creating jobs. The CBO estimates that we've created or saved three and a half million jobs. I think that is a record worth comparing. Mr. Shabbat, 30 seconds to rebut. Had to spend money in the short term, $814 billion. We're going to be paying for that for a long time into the future. We're borrowing money from China to do that. And he talks about tax cuts for the rich. This is the old class warfare games that the liberals like to play. Like to pay, play. Basically, what we need to do is keep taxes lower or cut them on everybody, I believe, across the board. And, you know, it's interesting, they didn't even, this Congress, for the first time in 34 years, couldn't even get their act together enough to pass a budget this year. That's the reason this year All right, was particularly Mr. Shabbat, thank you very much. Tom McKee of Nine News has the next question for Mr. Driehaus. Thank you, Clyde. Get back to the health care bill, Mr. Driehaus. The idea, what people want to know is, what is it going to cost? I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a company out there, a small business, 10 to 15 people. What is the owner going to have to pay? Will they be able to offer health care? What are the employees going to have to pay? What are they going to be doing uh, a year from now? Will they still have their jobs because of these extra costs? 90 well, seconds. Well, the good news for that owner is that he's not subject to the provisions of the health care bill because he's got fewer than 50 full-time employees. And this is about creating jobs, and it's about providing health care. What does it do? What does it cost? Well, what it does is it makes sure that insurance companies can no longer discriminate because you've got pre-existing conditions. It makes sure that insurance companies can no longer cut you off because you got sick. You know, only about 50 percent of all small businesses in the state of Ohio even offer health insurance. And those that are offering it have seen 20 and 30 percent increases in their premiums over the last two years. That is not a sustainable system. We have a system in the United States where 17.5% of our GDP goes to health care. Compare that to Germany, Japan, other developed countries, where that same number is about 10 or 10.5% 10 of GDP. 
it is not a sustainable system. For the first time, those small business owners that you talk about, Tom, they're going to get a tax credit if they offer health insurance for their employees. And they will be able to go out onto the exchange in 2014 and purchase affordable quality health insurance for their employees, or their employees can purchase it on their own for the first time in ages. So this is about reducing the burden on small businesses, about reducing the burdens on families. Mr. Shabbat, 90 seconds. Well, I'm glad to see Mr. Driehaus defending his vote on the health care bill and the health care package itself this evening uh, because there's not one Democrat in the whole country that's running ads on it that are defending the bill or trying to take credit for it um, because the thing is such a mess. The American public are against it now even more than they were when they passed this thing. And, and it's the process itself, you know, a 2,400-page bill, first of all, and then what they went through to pass it. Our Speaker of the House... You know, the top person in the House of Representatives saying we have to pass the bill to find out what's in it. What a remark from the Speaker of the House to talk about this bill. And then essentially buying votes, especially on the, the Senate side with the Cornhusker uh, kickback and the Louisiana purchase and all the rest. The American people didn't like the process, but they also uh, didn't like the bill. Uh, now. Are there things we should have done to reform it? Yes, there absolutely are. Medical malpractice reform. A lot of doctors right now have frivolous lawsuits filed against them, so they order expensive tests that drive up the cost just to protect themselves from these, from these frivolous lawsuits. Is that addressed in the bill? No, because the trial lawyers, the special interests, wouldn't allow the Democrats uh, to do that. Howard Dean, who was a former head of the party, came out and, and said as much. Um, there are a whole range of things we need to do, we should have done. At this point, the idea is to repeal it and replace it with good legislation that will really help the American people. Mr. Driehaus, your rebuttal. Look, in 14 years, he only voted against health insurance for kids. He never worked to expand health insurance. The fact of the matter is the bill had fewer words than the Harry Potter book. It doesn't take me three months to read a bill. I don't know about the rest of the members of Congress, but I read it, and we read it thoroughly. Uh, the Reconciliation Act that was passed along with the health care bill dealt with the corn husker kickback and those other deals that were made. Had you followed the whole process, you'd know that. But this is all about politics. This isn't about the truth for you, Steve. You want to convince people that it's a bad deal. Matter of fact, I'll show you all kinds of commercials being run by Democrats. All right, Mr. Greenhouse, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We invited you to submit questions online for tonight's debate, and here's the first. And we quote, widening I-75 just north of downtown Cincinnati and a proposed new Brent Spence Bridge involve federal funding. How committed are you to these projects, even if they mean displacing homes and businesses? Mr. Shabbat, we begin with you for 90 seconds. Yeah, transportation projects are important not to this, just to this community, but communities uh, all over the country. And I did support those. There are some things which aren't pork barrel spending. Yeah, I'm against pork barrel spending, bridges to nowhere type stuff. That's why I had one of the highest lifetime scores of any member of Congress, according to Citizens Against Government Waste. And most of the people that support an organization like that aren't these big corporations and things. They're, they're smaller folks. That's who support these things because they're tired of having their money go for all these projects that aren't helping them. And when I was in Congress, um, I helped us to, to uh, get funding for the uh, Brent Spence Bridge, uh, $46 million. Now, Mr. Driehaus, and I think Lincoln knows what I'm talking about here, because Mr. Driehaus went when he had his announcement he was going to run again, and then later on at the Enquirer editorial interview, uh, Carl, and he said that Steve Shabba didn't lift a finger uh, to get money for Brent Spence Bridge. Absolutely not true. You know, we work to do that in a bipartisan manner with Ken Lucas, who was a Democratic congressman. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to work in a bipartisan manner. But oftentimes, the things that you do uh, that aren't good for a community. A good example would be funding uh, for this trolley car system here in Cincinnati. That's the type of thing, the light rail system prior to that. I always had uh, a standard that I looked at every single project that we were requested. I wasn't against all of them, but a lot of them are really wasteful. And the way a lot of the liberals look at it, this is money from heaven. Even though it's coming from Washington, it's still our money. Mr. Driehaus, your response for 90 seconds. Steve, a planning grant for the Brent Spence Bridge is not a $2.5 billion commitment to what's necessary for I-75 and the Brent Spence. The fact of the matter is, when I was just in my orientation, I went up to the chairman of the Transportation Committee. I asked him about the Brent Spence Bridge and what you had done. He said, you know, the only thing I remember about Steve Shabbat is that he sent me a cake shaped like a boat. I assume that was the Delta Queen. 
but he said nothing about the Brent Spence Bridge. When I got into Congress, we started meeting weekly with Jeff Davis's office, with the senators, and with the entire delegation in this area to make sure that funding was in place for the Brent Spence. We went to the chairman of the Transportation Committee, and we got them to create projects of regional and national significance. And then I brought the chairman of the Transportation Committee here to Cincinnati to show him firsthand what the infrastructure was like and how desperately needed we needed the infrastructure for I-75, the Brent Spence, and the rail traffic behind Union Terminal. He left here saying this is one of the top five infrastructure projects in the country. That's leadership. That's what we need for Cincinnati. A planning grant doesn't get it done. You've got to advocate with the chamber. You've got to advocate with your colleagues on both sides of the aisle. You've got to advocate with the Senate to make it happen. That's what we've done. Rebuttal, Mr. Shabbat? Yes. Again, transportation is important. We worked on it. We got the money. Early on, it takes planning money. That's what we worked on. We're a little further down the road now. We'll be a little further down the road after you're gone, and I'll continue to work on that, and I'll work on it with keeping the jobs at GE and other things. But one of the biggest difference, again, not only will I work on the projects here, which are important to this community, but I'll actually work to keep your taxes down and to actually work towards a balanced budget. Because, again, this isn't just the money up in Washington, their money. That's your money. It's real money. All right, Mr. Shabbat, thank you. Our next question for Mr. Driehaus comes from Carl Weiser of The Inquirer. Um, for most voters, uh, the number one source of information about the two of you um, have been the avalanche of TV ads and mailers, almost all of them negative. Um, are there ads you think uh, cross the line, and why has this campaign been so negative? 90 seconds. Well, unfortunately, I think a lot of campaign ads are, are far too negative. And, and, Carl, again, your paper has continually uh, run fact checks, and they found Mr. Shabbat's uh, facts to be erroneous almost every time. Uh, he's suggesting the energy bill would cost families $1,400 a month. Do you know what that's based on, Steve? Because I asked you this the other night, and you didn't have the facts. It's based on a study that was done not even on the bill we voted for. You're, and you're out there trying to scare people. You know, he's running ads talking about Medicare or, or sending out mailers about Medicare, trying to scare seniors, telling them that we're cutting their Medicare benefits because we're doing the fiscally responsible thing and we are reducing the overspending in Medicare to insurance companies. That's the right thing to do. Now, he's also attacked me because I had an ad about a veteran who we got a Purple Heart for, and I believe he's here in the audience tonight. I'm very proud of that. He wasn't able to do it. His office didn't deliver the medals. We did. As a matter of fact, Steve, when you left your office, you shredded every single file for those Medicare recipients, for those veterans, every one of them. Every file in the office was gone. And we looked into it because you said you were required to do that by the government. Well, I've got a report right here that says you don't have to do that at all. They're your personal property. You can send them back to your constituents. You can get release forms from the constituents to then turn them over to the next member of Congress so they can ensure that they get their medals, All right. they get their Medicare. Thank you, sir. I'm going to have to interrupt now. Mr. Shabbat, you have 90 seconds. Well, thank you. The question was, are any of the ads uh, across the line? Um, a lot of them are inaccurate. For example, Mr. Mr. Driehaus's ad saying that I'm for privatizing Social Security. That's not accurate. Um, and he's, he talked about scaring seniors. Um, he's got a direct mail piece, and he referred to direct mail piece. He's got a direct mail piece that my mother-in-law uh, got at her house, and she's a senior citizen. And it uh, showed somebody who was supposed to be me with a sledgehammer coming after senior citizens. Now, I'm not going to come after senior citizens with a sledgehammer or anything else. We're trying to help senior citizens. Um, and the inquiry itself, um, so many people are voting early now that they actually came out with early, sort of like endorsements, kind of letting people who are early voting know where they're at. And the Enquirer said that they strongly endorsed me uh, over Mr. Driehaus. And one of the things that they mentioned in there, and they concluded with this, his, meaning Steve Driehaus's campaign ads, sound desperate and shrill. 
And I think the one in particular that they were referring to as desperate, and he's already alluded to it, was this one about a veteran and saying that we had dropped the ball and I either didn't care uh, or had been in Washington too long, because clearly that was a line that had been fed to him. Uh, and that's why we didn't uh, get the medals. And then Mr. Driehaus marched in on a, on a horse and got him. Essentially what happened is we were gone. We had to be out of the office by December 15th. The letter came out on December 22nd uh, and saying the medals are going to come, that we had earned some ice staff did the work, he took the credit. I think that's despicable. Your rebuttal, Mr. Driehaus. Well, again, Steve, we knew nothing about it because there were no records, so it's kind of tough to follow up. In terms of privatization of Social Security, you say you're against it, but your official position is you believe individuals should be allowed to take their Social Security money and invest it voluntarily in the stock market and keep those funds. That is the definition of the privatization of Social Security. That is what your own campaign manager said is your position. And I don't think my mom being on TV is shrill or desperate. And she's on TV for me right now. And there's a very positive ad about me with the city on my back talking about the future and moving forward. I think we're the only ones up with positive ads. All right. AM 1260's Lincoln Ware has the next question for Mr. Shabbat. 1230. I'm sorry, 1230. Here we go. All right. Mr. Shabbat, um, you know, we talk about the high unemployment rate in the country, uh, even in the district. Uh, people are looking for jobs. What can, if you're elected, what can you do to penalize the major corporations that are outsourcing jobs to India, Philippines, and places like that? Can you punish them, tax them heavily, or penalize them for sending jobs out of the country? Will you try to do that so we can keep some of those jobs here in the country? Penalizing people isn't going to work. What you need to do is you need to have... Uh, incentives for corporations to keep the jobs here if at all possible. You have to have trade agreements with other countries that are favorable to the United States and our corporations and our businesses and our employers and employees as well. Right now my concern with a lot of the, the deals, the trade deals that are made with other countries is we lower tariffs on both sides which I think is a good idea and the problem is is we make it easy for products to come into this country uh, but we make it oftentimes we don't enforce the rules against China and Korea and Japan and Germany and other countries and they're able to keep our products out so we have to be a lot tougher than we are right now in the in in these trade deals and we have to be competitive um, our education system has to be a lot better the Cincinnati public schools have to have to get better and they've made some progress in many areas obviously we're at one of the centers of, of uh, progress here at the new school for the creative and performing arts and I've been down to the other one many times over the years and I'm coming back here tomorrow actually I think to, to speak to a couple of the classes um, this is this is an example Walnut Hills another great example but we've got other schools that we need to do a lot better job so the problem is our kids are competing with the kids that are going to school a lot and learning a lot in Korea and these other countries. So we've got to have a workforce that's, that's uh, educated. Then they have to get good training. Uh, and, and that's the way we keep jobs here, have the corporations and the other companies be competitive with other countries around the world. Mr. Driehaus, 90 seconds. Well, Mr. Shabbat has a 14-year track record, and it's deplorable. We lost millions of manufacturing jobs to overseas uh, firms and, and to foreign countries like China and elsewhere. And they did little to stand up to China. As a matter of fact, they continued to okay trade agreements that weren't about f fair trade, but they called them free trade. And under the Bush administration, there were five times fewer enforcement actions against violations of those trade agreements than there were previously under the Clinton administration. The fact of the matter is, is that Mr. Shabbat voted time and time and time and time again for tax breaks for companies moving jobs overseas. Just in the last six months, we've closed many of those loopholes that were created under the Republican Congresses. Again, is there any wonder that all these big corporations want their friend back in Washington? They're paying for Steve Shabbat's campaign. They're financing his campaign because they want to go back to business as usual in Washington. Now, your campaign manager, Steve, said, well, that was just a function of the global economy, and that just happened. The fact of the matter is trade policies are specific policies that are created by administrations and the Congress. You have the ability to enforce them. You failed to enforce them, and you repeatedly voted for tax breaks that sent jobs overseas. And again, right here in Cincinnati, 38,000 manufacturing jobs lost under your watch. 30 seconds for rebuttal, Mr. Shabbat. 
Steve, if you like to debate my campaign manager, I could have him come out here and debate you. Um, now, it's just wrong-headed to say that I voted to give tax breaks in favoring companies to go overseas. That's just, that's just not true. Uh, he keeps talking about campaign money uh, coming to me, et cetera. Um, he hasn't yet explained, and I asked him this the other night, and he still hasn't explained, why it is that Charlie Rangel, who has had to give up the chairmanship of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, gave him $14,000, and he has refused to give it back. Twenty-seven other Democrats did, but Mr. Driehaus won't. All right, sir, thank you. We have another question submitted online now. Federal tax dollars are being used to jumpstart the streetcar project connecting Cincinnati's downtown and uptown areas. Do you support the project and the federal investment in it? Mr. Driehaus, you have 90 seconds to begin the response. You know, I didn't take a position on the streetcar, and, you know, that's up to the city and the mayor and the council members who believe it's a priority. Uh, they have looked at it. They've studied it. They've determined that there will be an economic benefit. They then competed for federal funds, and they received federal funds. Um, I think it will lead to economic development. I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea, but I do think it's a local decision to be made. Um, what I've done, I've continued to make investments in infrastructure. I've continued to push for funding of the Brent Spence Bridge. I have worked very closely with the chairman uh, of the Transportation Committee to help us get a better handle on creating a barge facility uh, on the river, to connect that to our highway system, to connect that to our rail system. I think investment in rail, rail between the cities and the state of Ohio, both freight and passenger rail, is critically important. Now, I think Mr. Shabbat would disagree with that. He believes that we should allow oil companies to keep dictating to this country what we should do in transportation policy. I think that's wrong-headed. I think it's the wrong way to go. We need to be investing in barge. We need to be investing in rail. We need to be investing in our infrastructure. So the extent to which they believe this grows the economy here in Cincinnati, they competed for the funds, they received the funds. Mr. Shabbat, 90 seconds. Yeah, the answer is pretty simple for me, no. Um, I don't think... Uh, the streetcar here uh, would be a good use of tax dollars. And Mr. Driehaus uh, said, that, well, he didn't think it was a bad idea, but it was a local project. We all know they're going to want federal dollars. So it does become a federal issue, and you've got to decide where you stand, Steve. And where I stand is against it. Where he is is uh, it might not be a bad idea. So there's a clear difference there. Um, also, this, uh, the project, if you want to look at another real project, the one where we're going to go from here to Dayton, to Columbus, and up and end up in Cleveland, and it's only going to take us six and a half hours to get there. Now, they want lots and lots of uh, federal dollars uh, for that as well, millions and probably perhaps even billions. And, and what it ultimately comes down to, they can sucker you into these things and say, here's some free money. Again, Never think of it as free money, because it's your money. It's just your federal tax dollars uh, that are going up there. This is all your money. But they sucker you into getting in it. But what they don't tell you is how much is it going to cost every year thereafter. Um, so a lot of these things are just big boondoggles. That's how we've got this huge debt that we've got hanging around our necks right now, over $13 trillion. And yes, a goodly part of that was under Republican administrations. I fought with the Republicans in Congress. I don't think we were nearly uh, fiscally prudent enough and oftentimes did vote against. We had, uh, he talked about he voted against omnibus bill. Good, I'm glad you did, Steve. I voted against every omnibus up there. When the years I was up there, we had 11 or 12 of them, and I voted against every one of them. Always remember, this is your money we're talking about. Thank you, sir. Mr. Driehaus, your rebuttal. Well, you were there for a much longer time than I was. I had a chance to vote against one, and I voted against that one. The fact of the matter is the debts keep growing because we keep extending tax breaks to millionaires, and we failed for decades to invest in our infrastructure here in the United States. This Congress has finally taken infrastructure as a priority. It's something government should do, is invest in our infrastructure. And we are depleting our resources when it comes to fossil fuels, when it comes to oil, and it's becoming more and more expensive to get those Mr. minerals. Mr. House, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Mr. Shabbat, 9 News reporter Tom McKee has the next question for you. Thank you very much, Clyde. Many parts of the district have been hit hard by foreclosure, and the news has gotten even worse with disclosures in the past couple of weeks that some of the foreclosure proceedings have been totally fraudulent. Name three specific things that you could do to help people in the district stay in their homes if they're in trouble. 
This is a question. Mr. Shabbat, yeah. 90 seconds. Thank you. You were looking at Steve. I wanted to make sure I was first here. Um, yeah, you know, this is something that I worked in a, in a bipartisan manner and will continue to do if I get back to Congress. Um, I worked with John Conyers, who, after the Democrats took over the Congress back in uh, 2006, he was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, took over for Jim Sensenbrenner, who had taken over from, from Henry Hyde prior to that. And Ohio was one of the states that had it the worst in, in foreclosure. And we worked with Conyers, and I was the only Republican that actually worked and pushed for a bill that would have given, it would have allowed more people to stay in their homes that were going through foreclosure, at least they had a chance. And what it would have done is given the bankruptcy judges the ability to reduce the interest that was the interest rate and also the the amount that was still owed on that particular property because what and more people could have stayed in their homes the idea being that it's not just the family in that home that's affected when you lose your home certainly they're the most directly affected but it also affects the whole neighborhood it affects the property values and all the rest and the, we always we have to remember what started this whole mess uh... you can go all the way back to the community reinvestment act putting a lot of people into homes that they weren't ultimately going to be able to afford. And then, even though Republicans took most of the blame because Bush was in the White House for the meltdown and the foreclosure, you can still go back and see Barney Frank, who's contributed pretty extensively to Mr. Driehaus over the last couple of years, and Maxine Waters and Senator Chris Dodd. Those were the folks that were defending, not doing something about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac when we could have avoided the foreclosure Shabbat, meltdown. I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut you off. You have 90 seconds now to respond, Mr. Driehaus. Well, the reason he can't name three specific things is because he hasn't done three specific things. <clears throat> he didn't hold a single meeting, public meeting, on housing during the entire housing crisis. I created a task force to go after it. We passed predatory lending legislation in the state of Ohio because state reps such as myself pushed for it. We realized the cost in our neighborhoods. I joined a federal lawsuit against property flippers in order to reclaim some of the funds for the neighborhoods who were losing the properties. I helped pass Wall Street reform, finally holding the Wall Street bankers accountable for their credit default swaps, their collateralized debt obligations, their mortgage-backed securities, the instruments that had run amok allowing this crisis to happen, while Steve Shabbat and his Republican colleagues stood silent. I encouraged the governor to create a foreclosure task force, which I served on, and we helped prevent thousands of foreclosures in the state of Ohio. And every day my office gets calls, and we help get constituents in touch with mortgage counselors and with HUD and with the Treasury Department in order to bring down the costs to modify their loans to keep them in their homes. I've worked harder on this issue than any other legislator locally, without a doubt. And I will continue to work to defend our families going into the future. Mr. Shabbat, rebuttal. Well, you must have worked harder on just about every issue, Steve, because you're taking credit for just about everything that's ever happened in this community. Um, now, we didn't hold a hearing because I wasn't the chairman of the committee to had jurisdiction. You don't hold a hearing unless you're the head of the committee. And then finally, when he could have done something at the state level, they had a foreclosure vote in the state, uh, at the state legislature. He skipped the vote, probably the most important vote there. He went to Washington for a political fundraiser. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. That concludes the questions. We move now to the closing statements. The first goes to you, Mr. Driehaus. You have two minutes. Well, that most important vote was about bankruptcy, and it passed almost unanimously. Um, there's no doubt who has fought for this community. And you know, at the end of the day, this race isn't about Steve Shabbat, and it's not about me. Uh, it's about the little kids at home that aren't even watching this debate, but are dependent upon our actions as we move toward the future. Now, we've been asked a lot of questions, and Mr. Shabbat said, you know, he really didn't take any action to prevent the foreclosure crisis. You know, he really didn't do anything to stop that deficit from growing. Section 8 exploded, he offered some amendments. He got a planning grant in his 14 years for the Brent Spence Bridge. We have to do better. This is about the future of this community. This is about the future of this region. And I'd ask you just to look five years out, ten years out. Who do you think is going to be leading the charge to create jobs? Who do you think is going to be leading the charge to make sure that thousands of Ohioans have access to quality, affordable health care? Who do you think is going to be leading the charge when it comes to a fair system of taxation, 
rather than benefiting millionaires over everybody else. I think the proof is in our leadership. I've been there for 22 months, and I have repeatedly shown the type of leadership that Cincinnati needs in Congress. Mr. Shabert was there for 14 years. He had his opportunity, and he didn't come through for Greater Cincinnati. He didn't come through for his constituents, who, as he left office, let them down by getting rid of, destroying every single one of their files. If he cares so deeply about those constituents, wouldn't he hand those over to a successor? I think we need leadership for those kids. I think we need leadership for the future. And I think we're providing that leadership today. And I ask for your vote on November 2nd. Thank you, sir. Mr. Shabbat, you have two minutes for your closing statement. Thank you, Clyde. And I'd like to, again, thank everyone for coming this evening and those that are listening at home. I'd be remiss if I didn't correct a couple of things that he said. There's so many I don't have time to go into them, or that's all I'd be talking about. Um, we were advised by the, the uh, General Service Administration to shred the documents. That's what we did. That's the same thing that David Mann did before he turned it over to us. That's essentially what you do for privacy reasons. Now, in my opening statement, I had said that uh, this election would be about moving forward. We both agree that we ought to move forward. It's just the direction that we ought to go. Now, Mr. Driehaus has consistently followed his party boss's marching orders. Nancy Pelosi voted with her 94.8 percent uh, of the time. Um, he's done what he was told to do, essentially. Um, and I don't think he's really represented us. He's represented the Democratic leadership, even though they've kind of abandoned him right now. Now. I think it's enough's enough. I don't think we can afford any more of this. We can't afford any more of these big spending stimulus bills. We can't afford these budgets. $2.7 trillion over the last two years were bankrupting the country. We can't afford these huge new energy taxes that we had facing us if the legislation he voted for became law. We can't afford any more of these health care debacles. Now, I will stand up for you. I'm not going to stand up for the Democratic Party leadership, which is essentially um, all he's done. And what we really need to do is to get this country back to work. We need to get this economy moving again. You do that by reducing the tax burden on the American people, the regulations, the health care bills. We need to repeal that thing, I believe. Uh, and there's the real difference. I think, between Mr. Driehaus and myself in this whole election, it comes down to this. That Mr. Driehaus believes that Washington is the answer. I think Washington's the problem. And if you agree with me, I would appreciate your vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Mr. Shabbat, Mr. Driehaus, thank you both for being with us tonight. This reminder, early voting is underway right now in the state of Ohio. If you're registered in Hamilton County, you can vote at the Board of Elections offices, Broadway downtown, from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, 8 till noon Saturdays, from noon till 4 this Sunday, October 24th. Butler County, the Board of Elections on Princeton Road in Hamilton, open from 8.30 till 4.30 Monday through Friday, till 7 on Wednesdays, and from 8.30 to 12.30 Saturday the 23rd, and 8.30 till 4 on the 30th. Again, Election Day is November 2nd. The polls will be open from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Nine News, of course, has the election covered for you with the results instantly available on election night. Continuous coverage on digital channel 9.2, Time Warner channel 22, online at WCPO.com, and on your phone with Nine Mobile. Of course, if you missed any part of tonight's debate, you can see it on WCPO.com. Of course, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber, League of Women Voters, Cincinnati Association, The Inquirer, and WCPO-TV, and it goes without saying we thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good night.